Good afternoon, everyone. It is three o'clock, three o'clock in the Netherlands, and we are global today. We have people from California all the way to Japan, all the world talking about one thing that makes us very, 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 very focused on photonic integration, packaging and testing. Let's bring together the entire supply chain to connect with the photonics industry. When it comes to packaging of photonic integrated circuits, making industry standards has to be the final long-term goal. But what about today? I believe that the short-term goal is that all of us need to be working together and not reinventing the wheel. So in our Epic Online Technology Meeting on Monday, April 26, we should address where is the industry going for integrated photonics packaging. What are the thoughts around design rules for peak packaging and standard ways of linking the packaging to the testing of the chips? We have invited companies who are working already on defining standard packaging rules, and we will discuss what part of the packaging needs to be standard for everyone. It could be where to place fiber arrays on the chip, or perhaps the relative position between the DC and the RF contacts. But which packaging rules are the same for all the applications? For example, a company that is packaging FNCW LiDAR, like Scantinel, has different packaging requirements to a company doing self-tune ultrafast transceivers like Effect Photonics or ultrafast polymer-based modulators like Lightwave Logic. Those design rules can only be properly defined if we invite all actors to the table. Just to name a few, we will have in the Zoom room NVIDIA, Facebook, Molex, Sequoia, TE Connectivity, Broadcom, Cisco or Intel. And there are issues to discuss and collaborations to start. For example, the recurrent discussion is around active or passive alignment, or both. I put my money on both. Do we need micro optics assembled individually with pick and place technology on the top of photonic integrated circuits? Or do we foresee the direct processing of micro optics as a new layer in wafer level packaging? Here, my money is on wafer level packaging. At the European pilot line picks up, SUS Micro Optics is providing micro optics using nano imprint lithography, and Vanguard Photonics is using two photon polymerization for ultra high resolution 3D printed micro optics. Indeed, wafer level packaging is the promised land. We are following recommendations from EPIC members in the semiconductor industry, such as ST Microelectronics or ATNS. Remember, they had to make similar decisions 40 years ago. We want to move as many packaging processes as possible from die to wafer level. But what can we move? when and how and which kind of volumes justify such paradigm shift? Finally, for many new applications that Photonics is addressing, you need your working demonstrator produced as quickly and inexpensively as possible. That may mean producing a non-optimized package that allows you to show the proof of principle. Are there such packaging solutions available today? And are they inexpensive enough to offer innovators a genuine test before invest opportunity? If you want to contribute to our deep dive discussion on the next step challenges for peak packaging, sign up immediately to follow up with our experts in the Epic Zoom room on April 26. Thank you very much and please accept my apologies for the a little bit longer introduction that we are used to, but the topic today is very important. We really want to address with equipment suppliers all the way to semiconductor manufacturers, what process is dependent on application and what is independent, what design rules can we have, and most important, most important, what players do we need to bring to the table? It's going to be a fantastic next two hours. First of all, I would like to acknowledge for many of you already know, last Week, two weeks ago, we accomplished a fantastic milestone. We are now 700 friends in the family. Thank you very much, all the members of Epic for supporting the association. 
no matter how fast or how much we grow, we'll always know each member individually. That's what defines Epic, and that is never going to change. My name is Jose Pozo, and I'm talking on behalf of a fantastic and amazing team of Epic technology experts. 15 people work at Epic, half of them have a PhD with a great gender balance and with great enthusiasm. This is the place for us to work and we love working for Epic. We organize events, we provide access to the network, we help you raise capital. We have the biggest website to find a job in the whole world in Photonics, jobsinphotonics.com. And anybody who is a member of Epic has a long list of market reports available for them to help with their technology company strategy. But today, Today, we talk about peak packaging. These are the events that we have announced all the way to summer holidays. Have a look at the one that we have on the 7th of June, Vixel Manufacturing and Applications with the main, main leaders on Vixel Manufacturing looking at what, what technologies they need for the packaging of their Vixels. That meeting is going to be epic, as epic as today's meeting. First of all, thank you very much, our media partner, Peak Magazine. Thank you for all the effort you're doing in promoting the activities of Epic. But most important, let me take a deep breath. This meeting will be possible with the support or sponsors today. First of all, Ficon Tech. Ficon Tech is a company actively applying high volume production line to any company who wants to take peak packaging to the next level. Equipment manufacturing based on active alignment for sensors, for LiDAR, for optical communications, all the way to navigation inertial sensors. But if you are looking for a company to take that equipment and make services for that, the company is in Singapore. It's an O set of photonics. The company is called Focus providing manufacturing of photonic integrated circuits package process. OFS is your partner for specialty fiber and telecom fiber. If you're looking for a customized fabric fiber solution, go to OFS, they'll help you. If you're looking for a European company setting up stone in something never done before, offering packaging of photonic integrated circuits into volumes, FIX is a success story all the way from Enschede, the are your partner of choice. If you are looking for thermoplastic material, you're looking for the material to make the optics, the wafer level optics, the micro optics uh, resistible to every environment, SAVIC is here in the room. If you're looking for a partner to help you with the backend process and the wire bonding of any photonic integrated circuit or any optoelectronic device, your partner is IM Tech. If what you're looking is my, for micro optics, micro Microoptics is the company that we have here is Accetris, all the way in Switzerland, developing microoptics and MEMS combined, being able to help you with the needs for the packaging solutions. But you're looking for semiconductor equipment manufacturer or a company to help you with the wafer bonding. They, they are in Florian and in, they are in Austria. The company is called EBG. And if you don't, you need further help on choosing, if you want to go for active and passive alignment, you want a non stop shop to, to help you with the right equipment for your manufacturing process, you have to go to Würzburg, the company is Ifotec. Ifotec will help you defining the whole process and setting in your place the machine of your needs for the volume production of integrated photonics. And setting me in my place and helping me with everything is my good friend and better R&D manager, Dr. Ana Gonzalez. Congratulations on all the hard work you have put on this. Tell us what's gonna happen in the next two hours. Thank you very much, Jose, for this introduction. Yes, I could not be happier today because we have uh, really ahead of us a, a very nice meeting. So we are going to have uh, discussions about the standardization uh, versus uh, customized packaging. Uh, also, we are going to talk about how to reach, uh, reach out uh, these large volumes, also about new materials, everything. And well, uh, we are expecting a lot of discussion with all the companies presented today at the meeting, uh, all the supply chain in photonic packaging and assemblies here today. So yes, we have all the companies doing vertically integrated networking solutions. Optical communication market is a very, very important one for us. We have all the companies doing services for packaging and assembly, or the companies doing uh, equipment, uh, companies doing semiconductor manufacturing materials everything. And well, last but not least, uh, all the European initiatives uh, that are in which uh, we are participating. So then we have Photon Hub for these uh, companies that are thinking about develop developing a product uh, in photonics and uh, we can help them uh, financially and also with the expertise uh, and with, uh, with training. Uh, also, we have a JPEX pilot line for these companies thinking about going to pilot production with indium phosphide chips. Uh, yes, and also there is an open 
can call now, we can help them. Uh, then we have PIXAC for packaging and assembly of all these uh, chips. Uh, and then we have Passion that is developing an entire uh, structure for uh, architecture, for, um, for optical communications in which uh, we have pixels integrated with silicon photonics. And MedFab, MedFab is for all these companies that want to develop a product uh, for medical applications based on photonics. Uh, and that's it. Uh, back to you, Jose. Anna has a huge passion for pilot production of photonics being done in Europe. She's doing a fantastic job on that. Congratulations, Anna, on working with the European Commission on this. This slide only corresponds to the companies who registered for the meeting today. So you are an Epic member and you forgot to register for this meeting. That resulted in your logo not appearing on this slide. Don't let this happen again. Register for the online meetings that are interesting for you. Of course, they are all free of charge. But this meeting is also live streamed in YouTube. So hello, YouTubers of the world. Thank you very much for being with us today. Please use the chat to post all your questions. I will read them in the room. And if you have any question, if you have any chance of linking with the company, you want to get in touch with any of the participants today, throw me an email, host.epic-asset.com, and I will be more than happy to make that introduction. And this is, of course, also valid for the people here with me in the Zoom room. Use the chat. We have a private chat. Use it to connect to each other. This meeting is about connecting. If after the meeting you didn't get a chance to speak to that person that you really wanted to, throw me an email, host.epic-asset.com, and I would love to make that introduction. Let's get the meeting started. A meeting about packaging in Epic could only start one way. Could start with the person who directs the picks up pilot line and is bringing everyone working together on using the same design rules for the packaging. Thinking about packaging all the way from design perspective, Peter O'Brien, thank you very much for starting, for kicking off this fantastic meeting today. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to the beautiful city of Cork, goes to Tindal National Institute, goes to the director of PixUp. The floor is yours. Jose, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Thanks very much, and Anna and everyone in Epic for organizing this. It's great to see some faces again. As Jose said, um, it's what's important I want to talk about today is not what we do in this, you know, this packaging services and picks up because really we're not we're not there to, you know, we're, we're there to support industry. But really what I want to talk about is the move towards standardization and looking at lower cost packaging and, you know, how we're, how we're working both in Europe and globally to to achieve that. So you've probably seen this before, um, the kind of packaging capabilities uh, we originally developed in PixApp and we're continuously adding to those. So a whole range of optical, electrical, thermal, mechanical, and they're working very well. And we, we're engaging with now, you know, about 150 um, companies across the world um, from multinationals to startups, SMEs, um, and a whole range of applications. And as Josue said, we have to be very careful that we're not, you know, customizing, reinventing the wheel um, and making sure that we, we really kind of like develop uh, standards in that way. So I think this view graph really captures that. And essentially what you have on the left hand side is what we call the foundry PDK. So this is the process design kit. So typically that would include things like modulators and, and different types of wave, wave guides and different functionality on the actual photonic chip. And um, there's building blocks, there's, there's a library, and for example, OptiDesigner with Synopsys make that available. So it's relatively straightforward process to be able to lay out a photonic device, go to a foundry, um, and that's validated, that PDK is validated. So what we've been trying to do in PixApp, besides you know, developing up the packaging capabilities and offering to people, offering those uh, capabilities to people industry, um, is really to kind of try and put a standard process around that. So over the last number of years, what we've been doing is develop what we call an ADK, and that's an assembly design kit. So in that ADK, we've got a whole range, and it goes back to that previous view graph that I showed, fiber attach, micro optics, flip chip of electronics, different types of electrical packaging, ribbon. Um, I also mentioned flip chip, but different types of wire bonds, laser integration, and we're continuously adding to those. And we basically it complements the, the PDK. And when you bring those together, and again, we've been working with Synopsys because they're part of our uh, pilot line, formalizing that into a standard offering. So again, it's a software-driven ADK, much like the PDK. So designers can, can pull from the library um, and uh, build out their, their package. So ensure that the chip is laid out that it can be packaged. 
And we don't want that just to be from a from a Pixar perspective. We want to make sure that the companies across the Europe and across the world and other foundries like um, AIM Photonics, and I'll give an example of how we're working with AIM, we take a similar approach. And that enables people then for different applications to, uh, to, to uh, lay out the chip that it's suitable for packaging. So this is just one example. Um, this is one of our demonstrators. We have a number of demonstrators to show how all this can be done. So this is basically the PDK. So you lay out your chip, but it's laid out in so such a way the ADK interfaces with that. So as I say, this is a, a, a capability we've developed up in PixApp where we got the different types of electrical, ribbon, standard wire bonding, flip chip. These are drivers for the, the modulators on the silicon photonic chip. You can see this hybridly integrated laser and um, micro optics, and then the, 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 uh, the amplifier, the receiver. Um, and again, this is a demonstrator to show how all of that works. And what's really important is that the chips are laid out for packaging. So we've worked with foundries in Europe. We have these, uh, what we call reference chips. So they're following these design rules. Um, and basically, if you follow these design rules, this ADK that's in, in the Synopsys uh, software, the chips can be packaged. And as I say, we want to ensure that it's not just PixApp, other packaging providers, you know, they, they can avail of this type of layout uh, situation. So this is a very nice example. So when the chips are laid out in a, in a formalized way and they follow the respect the design rules, here you can see, for example, Ficon Tech are using these chips to validate equipment installs because these are standardized layouts. So the customer who buys this machine does not have to use their own product because you know, you're assuming that the product will be following these ADKs. So then therefore you can use this kind of agnostic or generic uh, reference chip to validate the machine. So that's just one example of how these reference picks not just are useful for validating packaging processes, but also equipment and other materials like fiber arrays, micro optics, et cetera, et cetera. So this principle of this type of generic reference pick has proved very, very interesting. And we're starting to work with other foundries around the world. So this is a very nice example. Over the last year, we've worked with AIM Photonics, the foundry in the US, um, Stefan Preble, Tom Brown, and David Harme in AIM. And again, they've kind of copied our approach. So as you can see in this particular chip, uh, it's basically like a Swiss army knife, if you want to call it, a whole array of optical and electrical IOs, edge couplers, grading couplers, bonds for flip chip, wire bonding, RF lines, photodiode heaters. And we're currently working on investigating how we can integrate lasers into this. So two and a half D type integration. And again, it's a standardized design following the ADK rules. So finally, just I want to mention a new, very exciting project we're working on called Photonic Leap. And it's kind of following that kind of ADK approach. We're bringing in new technologies, and this is driven around surface mount and using micro optics. So we're developing processes for integrating micro lenses onto PICs. And again, taking that surface mount, so really reducing the cost of packaging by, by a better order of magnitude, if not more. So that enables us then to do things like uh, multi-project wafer runs because it's, as Jose said, it's wafer level packaging um, and we can standardize the layout. So we, our ultimate objective is to move towards ADKs and design rules. And then we can scale up from multi-project runs to large scale wafer runs. And also the layout is compatible with wafer level testing, both optical and electrical. This is a type of ball grid array. So again, standardization, we're trying to drive that towards standardization. So I'll leave it at that and open it for questions, thanks. Thank you very much, Peter. Super interesting presentation, as always. Okay, so we have been hearing a lot about the standardization, right? Uh, and yes, PixUp has been working a lot in trying to standardize, uh, standardize processes uh, at all the levels of the supply chain. So it's not all uh, not only about the packaging, right? It's also that we need to talk with, with the foundries and we need to talk with other actors to make it possible. Um, what would you say that are the... Where should we put more effort uh, here to get uh, really all this supply chain uh, working like only one and to go to these uh, large volumes? Well, I think actually what we're beginning to find now is a lot of the foundries have different layout scenarios. So um, you can standardize packaging to some degree, but to another degree, you have to be able to interface with foundries. And you know, the, the question is, can foundries adopt their processes? So do you change packaging to adopt to each foundry? Um, by that, I mean, you know, silicon and indium phosphide are probably two, ex two very different uh, scenarios. But even within silicon photonics, we're beginning to see um, different layouts. 
uh, different, you know, oxide layer thicknesses. Uh, you know, certain scenarios of electrical integration are quite different. Um, another area that is kind of like a secret sauce, if you want to call it, is things like epoxies. So um, one of the big challenges that we're finding at the moment, you know, when you start a project with a company, they really just want to get their parts made, prototyping. But then they move to the next level where they're looking at reliability and things like solder reflow compatibility. Poxies are very, very, you know, challenged in that environment. And they can start to fail. They start to move. You have CTE differences. So that's another area. So I think it's important to start to get the material suppliers involved as well. So it's not just the foundries and the packaging houses and the equipment providers. It's the kind of, you know, the different types of uh, suppliers of different mater epoxy materials. And we're also looking at solders. So using solder instead of epoxy. So metal solders and metallizing fiber arrays and things like that. So that's the next area that needs to be developed. So materials are important. Very good that you mentioned about materials because we have in the room a few companies uh, that I'm sure uh, they can help you. But let's come back to the standardization um, the standardization topic uh, because I would like to give now the floor to John from uh, Bay Photonics. Uh, hello, John. How are you doing? Everything fine? Yes, everything's fine. Thanks. Hope you can hear me. Maybe you could comment uh, about the, the, the approach uh, that sure. you have at Bay Photonics uh, that probably is not related to a standardization, but more about customized uh, packages, right? Yes. Um, we, whilst the processes might be standard, becoming standard, most of the applications and most of the individual requirements are pretty much custom. And from that perspective, we're looking on how to combine capabilities associated with uh, RF design on board, optical design on board, how to include micro-optic devices into each uh, package to make the assembly low cost, perhaps hermetic, and uh, make it in a way that's suitable for manufacture using the uh, standard equipment that is becoming available for uh, assembly and test. So. From our perspective, um, PDKs might be a great start, but unfortunately it goes a lot further than that. And you're involving so many more um, um, areas of physics to actually get results. And uh, you're using the expertise of people that have worked in photonics and electronics for 20, 30 years to understand how to make those um, solutions a reality within a package. So standardization for us from the design and prototype stage doesn't really exist right now and can't really see it going that way, unfortunately. Well, I, 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 I strongly contest that because the foundries we work with, the large foundries, they basically, PDKs are the way they operate. And, yeah. you know, I think it's important. One of the challenges is when you look at an application, do you do you bend to the application requirements or do you ask the application engineers to say, these are the rules? In electronics, that's the way you do it. You say, this is the way it's designed. And really, photonics for too long really has been highly customized. And it's, you know, so adopting to the way foundries work, for example, in silicon photonics, they are extremely rigid and they don't change. It's billions invested in those lines. So it's not possible to modify those. So having ADKs and PDKs essentially is the only way they can operate and having it standardized, modifying those processes are enormously expensive. Yeah, and completely agree with that. And uh, we don't anticipate asking foundries or semiconductor or um, pick designers to modify their design um, design techniques. Indeed, quite often, picks are designed a lot before they actually come to us and ask, so now how are we going to assemble and package it? Uh, so we then have to modify our approaches yeah. uh, to allow the capability of a standardized pick um, design method. Yeah. Well, we can, really, we, we can really ask the foundries if we want. For example, we have here uh, Milan from University of Southampton. Uh, hello, Milan. How are you doing? Hello. Hello, Anna. Hello, everyone. I'm doing and well. You have, you have a question uh, for Peter, right? And also maybe you can give your opinion from, uh, I mean, as Cornerstone as well, yes, about this yes. standardization. I mean, Yes, I mean, we are talking about standardization 
for a long time, and I think I, I agree that you know I, I think we will need uh, we'll need some standardization in silicon photonics. Uh, the, the the question I had uh, for for Peter is more about the costs. So in one of his slides, uh, I think he mentioned that he reduced the costs of packaging. So in your opinion, Peter, what do you think, uh, what proportion of the entire product costs do you think is reasonable to be used for packaging and wafer scale testing uh, in the overall production line? Yeah, well, it, it drops with volume, but right now packaging is, is well, and test is over 50%. And if you look at electronic packaging, it's down around, say, 10, 20 percent. I, I do believe that um, we need to move. I, I think MEMS packaging is somewhere where we can start to move towards. That's why things like surface mount type approaches are important. So we standardize the, uh, the design format um, and moving down to maybe 30 percent of the cost. You have very expensive materials like fibers, very expensive. And they, they are to some degree customize you know they're they're handmade almost um so so that that's a that's a real challenge so avoiding those like for example global foundries and ibm i think alexander will talk about their v groove integrated on their pick you know, that's a that's basically a pdk integrated from a packaging perspective that really drops the packaging cost down so using that type of approach you know you're, you're moving down to maybe the 30 percent but at the moment it's it's well above 50 60 percent and for including test um, and that really comes down to the, uh, you know, the, the lower volumes. And one thing I would say is that generally, you know, years ago, we engaged with people who came to us with picks designed. Majority of people, I would say by far the majority of people come to us before they design any pick now. And we, we basically say, do this and do not do that. And in some cases, we can't work with them because the picks have been designed such that they cannot be packaged. So that's what drives the cost way up. And I think that's what gives the reputation of packaging has been so expensive. Um, but if you follow those rules, you know, and the PDK and the ADK is a great way of doing it because it's in the software. You don't have to read a book or a manual and, and try and interpret that. And um, that can bring the cost down below the 50%. And it's moving down towards, you know, I, I think MEMS is a good way of, you know, looking at it. It's, it's not very low cost electronic. It's somewhere in the middle. Okay, uh, th thank you very much. And just one more, one more quick question regarding the wafer scale testing. Um, how, how long do you think this should be done? I mean, is this like a few minutes per wafer or, um, you know, like... Uh, well, okay, so th this, this comes down to, are you doing functional testing? So are you actually testing the full functionality of what you're making or are you doing cell testing? So, and and there, there are lessons we can learn from the electronics world. So are we looking at a portion of the chip? Are we checking, checking you know, waveguide coupling? Are we, or are we just looking at a modulator, a test structure? Are we looking at the full part? But you know, ultimately, it's going to come down to ease of access, so probing. So for example, our surface mount wafer level type structure that the, that the photonic leap has, it's got a ball grid array at the bottom, so you can probe electrically. And then the optical axis is from the top, so you can easily move across. And that's you kind of got to work from, you know, from the uh, what you want to make ultimately and work back and say, how can we make a package that achieves that? So something like a surface mount ball grid array will enable that. So we're looking at, you know, seconds really for, from a test. I, I would say that kind of scenario. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this discussion. Now I would like to give the floor to another company that is doing also is providing also packaging services. So Sander from CATC, uh, do you think it's a good moment now to explain what are the services that you are providing? Uh, yes, yeah. Perfect. So I, I just forwarded the slide, but I, I would say that we are not really a, a packaging company. We are more uh, a company where we develop the technologies to integrate chips into packages. Maybe if we, you want to share this, this slide. By oh, I, I, I thought I, could, I, I would have forwarded it, but I can share it, of course. Yes, the green button down. Yeah, yeah, but then I have to open it. Uh, give me a minute. Sorry. Uh, don't worry. Um, yeah, uh, here it is. Ah, very good. If you can go to presentation mode. My computer would let me. And uh, yes, here it is. Yeah. 
So uh, I work at CITC. So uh, we are the, the Chip Integration Technology Center. We are located in, in Nijmegen, in the, in, in the Semiconductor Valley in the Netherlands, I would say. And last year, uh, we started a podium, which is a consortium of, of several companies. It consists of CITC, uh, FIX, uh, Tegema, and PI. And we focus ourselves on uh, developing technologies to integrate uh, photonics into, into packages. So we provide uh, packaging services from the entire process chain. So uh, we as CITC, we would develop technologies and in the, in the end, FIX could uh, do the packaging themselves. So we focus more on the materials uh, and on uh, high performance diet attach, uh, flip chip bonding technologies, which could be later be used by FIX and where then Tegema and PI uh, provides the equipment and tooling for that. Yeah. Okay, and what would you say that are the collaborations that you are looking for uh, in our network? Are you looking for packaging companies to do, do more the R&D? Um, so I think we were interested in companies who would like to develop their uh, yeah, their concepts or their ideas towards a industrial uh, path or to bring into uh, high volume manufacturing uh, things. Uh, and we are also interested in developing new materials such as uh, uh, high performance die attach. So uh, bringing better performance to the performance of the dyes. So better cooling or better temperature control um, higher reliability and positioning, those kind of technologies. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so then if there are no more questions or more comments about this part, uh, thank you very much, Peter, for this presentation and thank you everyone that uh, participated in this interesting discussion. And now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Michael Levy from Lightwave Logic. Uh, so yes, please, Michael, if you want, the, the floor is yours. Okay, Michael, we can see your slides. I don't know if you are mute. No, so everything fine. And now there is some something happens because we cannot hear you, Michael. Hello, Michael. Okay, so yes, maybe you can remove your headphones. Uh, can... Yes, now, perfect. Okay. So can you see the slides? I go into presentation mode? Not anymore. All right, so let me just uh, share the screen again. Does that work? Yes, now it works very well. All right, let me move to the, what I'm going to talk about is a, a white paper we just wrote. It's on our website if anybody wants to look at it. It's the uh, combination of the work that was done in the last couple of years on integrated photonics roadmaps. And in these few slides, I'm going to give a quick update of those roadmaps. And I'm also going to ask a question at the end. And some of the issues that revolve around packaging, integrated photonics packaging. So let me, uh, as we just used up a little bit of time, let me move through these very quickly. Um, this was the roadmap that was done in 2016. Now, real quickly, now it's a very busy slide. They're on our website. If you want to go into the details, feel free to do that afterwards. But you can see we predicted in 2016, what was going to happen in 2020. And this is a combination of both Europe and the US and some inputs from Asia. And you can see on the right hand side, a lot of the things that were predicted actually turned out correct. You know, transceivers at 400G, uh, metrics of links of less than $5 per gigabit. I'm not going to go through every one of these, but you can see there were some really nice predictions that really worked out. And so that was great. And then in 2020, another roadmap was put together. And you can see from this roadmap, there's some predictions for 2023 in that sort of range. You can see it goes out to 2028. And what you're seeing on these roadmaps is um, some three different areas. You can see, for example, 2023, there is expectation you're going to see 1.6 terabit per second modules, you know, metrics are less than a dollar per gigabit. So some really fast devices, lots of integration. But these roadmaps, they show the dates on the horizontal on the top and on the vertical, they show some of the technologies. 
you can see the lower green block to the left. And then you see some metrics in the top left. You also see black font. That's what uh, we, as uh, from a roadmap standpoint, expect to see on current base commercial efforts. And you can see the purple brick walls, similar to the red brick walls that you find in the electronics roadmap. But in this case, these are technology cost barriers. In photonics, we may have solutions to work through the brick wall and, and come up with great solutions, but they may not be in a cost structure needed for real commercialization. And on the right-hand side in the red font, you're gonna need some major industry effort to get to these type of metrics. And so that's sort of how the roadmap is sort of put together for a 2020 standpoint. And you can see, if you try and look at a trend of where these purple brick walls are, you see some technologies are easier than others. Like for on the top, it's gonna to be really difficult to design 1600 gigabit per second modules and the associated packaging that comes with that. And also to meet some of those metrics of less than a dollar per gigabit per second. We know from a device standpoint, it's gonna to be tough to design devices that have 3db, you know, SO, EO, S21 gigahertz bandwidths greater than 50. So looking towards how do you get to 70 and 100 gigahertz is actually not going to be easy. In fact, that was the subject of an epic uh, workshop last week, which was really interesting. And then you've got LSI challenges if you're doing the rays of pixels for structured lights, 3D arrays, that sort of thing. And so you can see where some of the challenges are going to be. Some technologies obviously do better than others. So let's go to, you know, where I'm representing, that's uh, light wave logic. We're doing electro-optic polymers, high-speed modulators. I mean, we're part of what I would call the high-speed and low-power club. And so we can see that the performance of these are pretty well, but we also have to think about how you're gonna package these guys. Just because you go fast doesn't mean you've got all the solutions. We know polymers are add additive to integrated photonic platforms. And this was a slide that uh, Karen showed last week. There's various different approaches of electro-optic polymers. I'm not going to belabor this because this is really a packaging uh, roadmap discussion. But you can see there's different ways to address, you know, chip scale, semiconductor, wafer scale type packaging with polymers. So let me move to the last slide really fast. And this is brand new for this uh, workshop, if you like. I put to this together over the last week. And by all means, I'm not the person that should be putting in, you know, 10 year roadmaps together. But what I would like to see from this forum is perhaps folks can take this blank packaging roadmap and help us fill it out. And you can see what I've done is on the top is a horizontal bar that goes out to 2030. On the vertical on the left, I bought some of the traditional packaging metrics. You've got traditional gold box, you've got surface mount, you've got chip on board, wafer scale. On the lower left-hand corner, you've got co-packaging layer one, chip on carrier, co-packaging layer two component. And so what I would like to see is how we would fill this out in terms of key metrics so that as a you know packaging industry for integrated photonics, we all have a roadmap that's reasonably non-competitive, but tells us where we're gonna go and what some of the obstacles may be. And so I leave this uh, talk at this point. I certainly would like to see this filled out. I've started it to give everybody an idea. And if we wanna use as an application, you know, transceivers with link reaches and metrics, and I've left them at the top three horizontal sort of arrows, then the lower two, four, five, uh, arrows. I've put some metrics in. I don't know if they're completely correct, but I think there's opportunity to fill this in to, you know, look at what Peter was saying, you know, the ADKs. I mean, it's a really interesting positioning. I mean, I do know working with foundries, I mean, you have to accept PDKs. We pay a lot of money to develop your own PDK with the foundry. I think ADKs are going to be becoming more important and perhaps this should be part of the roadmap. But um, in terms of, a, of integrated photonics roadmaps, I think we need one for packaging, not just the pick chips. And I think the packaging should be related to the pick chips, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the meeting last week was exceptional. Um, Michael, you, I, I think many people were very interested about this need for ultra-fast modulators. But uh, today, we, I really want to see how we can all together 
uh, give the right information for April developing the ADK. The first thing that comes to my mind is that in the last years, when we talk about uh, different applications, the biggest amount need that we had were uh, reducing the cost of fiber arrays. And please, please Peter O'Brien from PixUp, correct me if I'm wrong. We were working very hard on, on trying to reduce the cost of fiber arrays. But now what I'm seeing with discussions with the Go Package Optics community, that this is less of a challenge. Uh, Michael, where do you stand on this? Is there, in your opinion, the, the need for fiber arrays with the discussion that you are having with many of the people in the roadmaps, is it still a big challenge? And I want to go to Peter O'Brien for him to comment on this. Michael? I think Michael can't hear me or... Oh, I can hear you. I thought oh, yes. you were asking Peter a question. No, first you and then and then Peter. So when it comes to, to fiber um, arrays as a challenge, is that something that we have seen growing in the in the discussions? Because in my mind, I have seen it decaying a little bit. Uh, fiber arrays are important. You're going to see, I mean, the spatial arrays of uh, fiber connectors have improved. We've got to figure out how to get better arrays connected to pick chips. I mean, certainly, as Peter indicated, we've seen PDKs in fabs that deal with V-grooves. That's a traditional approach. We've seen some great in connections to fiber arrays. I mean, that's come on in the last few years. Um, this is not going away, Jose. It's not going to be just a single fiber and WDM, the wavelengths in a single fiber. We're going to have to figure out to do single arrays of fibers and even two-dimensional arrays of fibers. So that means the packaging has to be more complex. That means that the foundries and the packaging centers have to think through some level of standardization. I'm not saying it should be completely standardized, but this is tricky. I mean, we all know with fiber arrays, you know, with the MT connectors, the MPO connectors, it wasn't easy to develop 20 years ago. When you start looking at two-dimensional solutions, it gets quite, quite complex quickly. And at this point, I'll let Peter join in because Peter's uh, doing this on the front line here. Excellent, Peter. Tell us, how is that is that a, a decaying demand, a growing demand? Are there solutions or related to decrease the cost of fiber array assembly? Well, it's, it's yeah. so in a lot of data comms, you see standard numbers of channels. So you might have, you know, uh, four or eight or something like that. But there's also another challenge that's coming up, um, you know, uh, where we see many other optical channels required. So there's a term you may have heard or you will hear more about. It's called the shoreline density. Um, so essentially, the number of optical channels you can get off the edge of a pick. Um, and this is a real problem because if you think about it, you're limited by 127 pitch. Um, so that, that's one thing. So the physical constraints on the number of channels you can squeeze out of an optical fiber array, that's just a design perspective. But the other thing is fiber arrays are intricate you know, to make. And you know, so the, as you go to higher, higher numbers of channels, that's a problem. So one of the ways you can get around that is, uh, you, know, you mentioned uh, the V grooves on, on the silicon photonics. Um, but for example, another approach, and we're, we're looking at this, is you're putting micro lenses down on the pick. So you expand the mode. And then you can have a connector with a, with a molded micro lens. And that's basically like a ribbon fiber will slot into that. So you, you've kind of got a V groove on the connector side with molded optics. Um, and you don't have this glass block with V grooves that you polish, all these kind of things. So one approach to avoid the use of micro, micro uh, sorry, fiber arrays is to put micro lenses and then you can make a pluggable connector. And we, we actually have a program around that, um, a, a, an international program uh, around the standardization. We have, you know, Molex and, and, and many other companies and we're working together on that. So micro optics is one way um, and uh, V grooves is another way. So you want to avoid these very expensive fiber arrays. And the other thing is when you put fiber arrays together in V grooves, they're not always aligned uniformly. Yes. You get variations and all these kind of problems. So it's, as I say, you've got the design of the chip and interfacing with these fiber arrays, and then you actually making fiber arrays is not easy. So for, for me, what we discussed uh, in different forums is that uh, first the problem with the six axis alignment of the fiber arrays, which is a challenge, but we discussed also the interposer approach. And yeah. I've seen companies doing the PLC technology, Team Photonics, by the way, is in the room, doing PLC technology, developing interposers for that and try to be less restricted on the distance between the fibers. How do you stand on this, Peter? And I, I, Adrian Bilat from Team is in the room, so I would like yeah. him to co comment on that. But first, you, Peter, how do you stand on this interposer? Is that something that your opinion is going to catch on in the market? 
Okay, so there's, there's a number of things there. Loss. So what's the loss? Because you've got to get into the interposer and get out of the interposer. So you've got to get a good justification for that. Um, cost and uh, just the actual process. So you've got an extra step. So it, it has to be justified in terms of process, cost, um, and performance. So if you can tick all those boxes, uh, definitely. Adrian, how many boxes can you tick? Hi, uh, well, thanks, Jose, for asking. That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, well, we hope to tick all of them in specific cases. So we are well aware of you know what Peter uh, described in terms of footprint loss and other things like this. And what we've reckoned so far is that interposers are like most useful for, for specific cases, especially with many, uh, many IOs. That's a, that's a case in point. And we hope that with this new technology that we call evanescent coupling, we can, we can tip, tick uh, most of the boxes, you know. I don't know if I can show a slide or two. Always. Yeah. This is your, no, one, one slide and ultra fast photonics way. Okay, <laughs> great, great. So I'm uh, doing my best to put it on. So, okay, so this is this is pretty much the slides. Hope you can see it. Yes. So edge and top, well, you know them. That's uh, uh, edge couplers, gradient couplers. Well, the first one is evanescent and that's where we hope to tick the boxes. So here the idea uh, is to go like in an evanescent way, like to couple the, the interposer uh, mode directly to the silicon photonics layer or any other layer of uh, high index contrast. And through the top, so it requires some um, some extra steps, like etching the back end of line, the cladding. But that way, you can you can have like be compatible with passive alignment, with uh, visual uh, alignment machines, like just the camera through the interposer. And um, optically, you can transmit both both polarizations, and over a broad spectral band, um, uh, like be compatible with uh, with uh, WDM, for instance. I don't want to talk yet about the active and passive alignment. I want to talk later, but the question here is loss. 1.5 dB. Is that suitable, uh, Peter O'Brien? Is that something that you think is on the line? What is, in your opinion, the, the loss ideally from chip to fiber? That's, that's pretty acceptable, actually. You know, dB loss is pretty good. Um, it's very good, actually. The question is, will a foundry open up its uh, photonic layer to you? So um, will, it, will a CMOS foundry say, yeah, that's good. We'll open up our waveguides. And are the waveguides compatible with that design? And those discussions need to be had. So um, many foundries would not do that. They're, 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 they're reluctant to open up the, uh, they might be buried very deep. That's one of the challenges we face. So is, the, is this evanescent coupling, is it compatible? You know, if you go to a custom foundry, they might do that for you. That might be using e-beam or something. But will a large scale foundry make that process compatible? Um, and then, you know, our experience with some of the glasses, you know, the, the distance and the, if you have any contamination, it's very sensitive to that. So 1 dB is good, 1.5 dB, what's it over large volumes? And will a foundry open up its uh, photonic layer for you? You know what? I, I do believe that we do have more power than what we feel, and it is the OSATs, the companies doing the, the, the outsourced semiconductor assembly and test, that need to go on the foundry and say, our customers demand this, so you need to adapt your process for that. On that, we yeah, but they may not be able to do it, Jose. They might be fixed. Like, if you see some foundries now, they're making their, their silicon photonics on the backbone of a, an RF line, for example, and it's not easy to change it. So, you know, rather than having a custom photonic line, they actually have a kind of a quasi photonic electronics or F line, and it's very rigid. So, Mike, um, Michael, what do you think? Yeah. So, when I've worked with foundries for PIC chips, silicon photonics in general, I mean, foundries will have their PDKs. If, if you ask for something a little bit custom, maybe you want to change a process, change a metal, change a little technique, it actually costs quite a bit of money because the foundry has to go develop your particular process. And so the, the lowest cost and easiest way to work with foundries is to work with that PDK. If you've got a silicon photonics that's slightly custom, uh, it's going to cost a lot of money to change uh, ask the foundry to do those things. And I think it'd be the same if you're on the packaging side. If a foundry has PDKs for V groups and you want to do something slightly different, it's going to cost money to do that. And so the, the question is, is what's the most efficient way from a packaging standpoint, we can work with foundries that to do want to keep fairly rigid. Some of, some of the smaller players are a little bit more flexible, especially, uh, if you do silicon photonics and MEMS type players, I mean, a lot more flexible, but still we have to really be careful about this as we move forward. 
One more thing I want to add to the table. I'm, I'm a technology guy, so Anna is more worried about cost, uh, me less. I, I, Peter has a very interesting computer, Peter Harsman from CITC in the Netherlands, a company developing technologies for packaging solutions. Peter, uh, what's on your mind? Because I think it's a very important point. Yeah, just a quick question, I guess to uh, Peter O'Brien that will be. You mentioned the uh, shoreline density. Uh, you also mentioned the difficulty in, in making fiber arrays. Uh, do you see a perspective for multi-core fibers to get the uh, optical connection to the chip? Well, yeah, so multi-core fibers, if, 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 they, if the pitch is very accurately uh, defined to a point because they're surface, so you can't have a 2D array of waveguides. Well, it'd be very challenging to have a 2D wave at the edge. And foundries are tending to move a lot to edge coupling, but they're, you, you know, for grating couplers and, and, and that type of approach, multi-core would be a potential uh, route to to overcome that. Um, so so you know yes, but not for edge coupling. Okay, thanks. We, yeah. we actually we actually have one of the I think the market leader in multicore fibers today for Datacom. It's the uh, OFS is in the room. John Earnhardt, are you with us, John? I am. Good afternoon. John, answering Anna's approach about cost reduction, uh, is multi-core fibers for you a potential solution for the, what we're addressing here, multi-channel coupling from, from fiber bundle to chip? Uh, it's, it's something we're very active in, still in early stages in terms of product acceptance. Uh, in other non-telecom markets, we're very active in multi-core. Uh, it involves some similar technology in terms of manufacture. Um, one of the issues is still, how do you get in and out of the multi-core and, uh, and the cost associated with that through fan ends, fan outs, you know, possibly there's a micro optic solution. In my opinion, this is a beautiful, beautiful R&D project, but I am not sure about the cost approach on that. But Peter, have you done already something on this? Is there any activities going on trying to go from multi-core fiber from where you get a race. I've seen something from Vanguard Photonics. Are you doing something on that? Peter? Am I? P yeah. Um, no, not multi-core fiber. No, um, no, we're not. We're, we're really kind of focusing strongly now in, in micro optics. So uh, taking the beam off, expanding it, um, and uh, relaxed alignment tolerances to a pluggable type connector. So we're, there's, there's a lot of issues people are finding with bonding of fibers, especially with, I mentioned epoxies, um, reflow, they move. Uh, it's a very large kind of rigid component. Um, so the, so uh, we're not, is the answer. Not really, no. Back to another point, uh, back to Michael. Uh, you are developing right now like logic, uh, some of the fastest modulators that, uh, that we have in photonic integrated circuits uh, with polymer technology. Packaging a modulator is, is a challenge, especially when you're going to the 70 gigahertz plus modulation speed. Is there, in your opinion today, uh, a room for a test package. So a, a test package that is not optimal, but it could be taken to your customers for doing the test before invest approach. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, test packages is, is a normal sort of approach. Um, you know, traditional high speed opto devices like modulators were in gold box packages and they have been for the last 20 years. And, you know, gold box, can be sort of adapted into a test vehicle so people can see that. But really, you know, as we talk about integrated photonics, you're not really going to be talking about gold boxes anymore. Yeah. Um, but the test package vehicles are obviously very important. And you have to look towards, you know, wafer scale, semiconductor scale type packaging that go with integrated photonics. And that is the direction. Um, while gold boxes are still, you know, the classic vehicle they're certainly large and we have to move on from that as, as I've indicated from, you know, a packaging roadmap perspective. So yeah, there are vehicles, Jose. We have uh, three comments in the room. The first one, I, we're gonna go to ASE, ASE. I'm very interested about them because they are semiconductor manufacturing. Uh, uh, Brad from ASE, what's on your mind? Bradford? Uh, you see, yes, Brad Factor. Good, good afternoon, everybody. I very much appreciate hearing all the talks. Um, I have a few comments. One is that, well, first of all, can you hear me okay, Jose? Yes, loud and clear. Yes. Um, 
my first comment is I, I very much appreciate uh, uh, Peter and Pixap's work uh, for the industry, even though today I don't get to see that much of, it hasn't come to uh, fruition uh, yet, at least uh, in our large uh, factory infrastructure. Um, the second, uh, the, the second comment I have based on uh, resonates with uh, the comments uh, made by uh, multiple people is that there's a large, a huge opportunity in the wafer level packaging. And that, uh, uh, and, and feeding on to uh, Michael Webby's comment is that the smaller you make the package, the better uh, will be the electrical uh, performance. So the less one has to worry about um, uh, parasitics. So the smaller the features in the package, smaller the package, the easier it is to uh, uh, master the electrical performance. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I appreciate uh, all the comments today and I'm actively listening to, to our speakers and the, and the future comments. Thank you so much, Brad. Your one was semiconductor manufacturers in Epic. We have several yes. in the last year, many semiconductor companies joined. Peter, before you answer the question of Brad, I wanted to be complimented from something that I found out a couple of months ago. Enric Slaffer from ATNS, are you with us? Yes, Eric, good afternoon. I would like you to tell us because you are the market leader on PCBs and you are entering photonics, silicon photonics, and you want to find a way that silicon photonics is suitable to your PCBs. I want you to tell us, and especially Peter O'Brien, what is your vision? And let's see if him and the rest of the companies in the room can help you here. Uh, thank you for a short introduction. Uh, may I show some slides? One and ultra fast photonics way. Okay, perfect. Just show this slide that you and me have in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes, I go, go to presenta yes, very presentation. Yes, very good. Okay, this is just a short introduction about our optical PCB approach. Yeah, how uh, we would like uh, to integrate photonics in a stack up of a PCB. So, you know, uh, at and is a, a PCB maker, uh, as Jose already explained. And we're also dealing that we integrate uh, at the moment uh, electrical components, active components, and passive components. Uh, just, I want to activate my mouse. Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, this is more or less a cross-section uh, through the layer stack up of a PCB. Uh, and, this, and this dark area here is a, an integrated uh, active or passive components. You see, we can, uh, we can interconnect it with galvanic copper, yeah? from one side, from both sides, depends on the design. Yeah, uh, More thousands of uh, components can be integrated in a, in a, in a very small area yeah, that we also can reduce uh, more or less the, the signal traces, yeah, the path between the signals. And this is just a short explanation how we apply such a process. Uh, means we, we start with the standard core uh, FF4, yeah, which is suitable for uh, uh, transmission of electrical signals. We integrate the component, uh, we laminate it together in a standard PCB stack up, and then we can uh, apply the, the routing layers, yeah? unlimited number, uh, however it's, 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 it's possible for, for the customer design and also apply, apply the structuring. Uh, and now we see yeah, with, with, with this coming higher uh, data transfer speed yeah, that on one hand side with the, uh, with the existing dielectric material with copper and so on, we are coming more and more to the physical limits. Okay, we, we have to set more lanes probably in parallel, but then we, we waste more and more power consumption. Yeah? And the idea is that we are jumping more or less from the integration of the electrical components yeah? uh, to integrate the electrical and the optical components as well. Uh, it means it's a kind of all-in-one package, but we are talking about panel level format, not just uh, wafer level uh, format. So it means this might be uh, a very big impact in terms of costs 
yeah, to integrate electrical and optical components as well to increase the data transmission speed, the bandwidth, and uh, by a uh, higher level of integration uh, that we can reduce the energy consumption as well. And this is more or less a higher level sketch. Yeah? Uh, we have more or less a substrate or a PCB. It, it depends just on the on the uh, on the on the structure. Yeah, we we can go down to uh, to five micron line in space, for instance, as a carrier, and that we integrate. Yeah, a more or less a electro optical circuit board, which we are actually in in it, it's under development together with. Uh, with Fraunhofer EZM, yeah, it means to integrate uh, a glass module, yeah, which uh, which optical uh, components, and that we interconnect it also to the periphery, yeah, to electrical components. That's in few words the concept, yeah, what we are aiming for. You cheated on, on the amount of slides. You didn't cheat on the length of the message. I was very clear. Okay, Peter, don't answer yet because the question is not yet fully formulated. There's one more company that I need to bring to the mix and that company is developing thermoplastic materials and you will understand why. We have somebody from Savic in the room, Florian Yang, correct? That's correct. Florian is developing the, the, the thermoplastic material. I want to put together with the semiconductor manufacturers, we're going to be something fantastic together. Savik, uh, what's your story, Florian? Can you hear me loud and clear? Loud yes. and clear. Perfect. Thank you, Jose. So, um, Savik, for those who don't know us, uh, we are the second valuable chemical brand in the world um, globally. Um, and we are developing, um, in this case, um, specific thermoplastic resins, uh, high, performance, high performance materials. Um, that are used and have been used for decades um, in this industry. And um, just a few comments uh, Peter gave before um, are actually the reason why we are here. Uh, we want to get involved as a material supplier. Um, we are working on uh, micromoded optics in that area. And uh, we do combine the advantages of the thermoplastic uh, molding process um, with um, the CTQs of the industry, like reflow solidability, um, low CTE, um, low dimensional change after reflow and these kind of things. Um, so we have been a member of EPIC for a few years um, now, and it's really um, uh, of high value for us to learn where the industry is moving and how our materials could potentially fit in that, um, in that um, nature, in that environment. Um, as said, we did start decades ago. Um, the main application space were actually lenses and optical elements in uh, placable transceivers. We have been there for more than 30 years. And now with the industry moving more to onboard optics and co-packaged optics, um, we also have um, developed materials that do, as I said, uh, pass brief go soldering and are moldable, um, opening up new um, application spaces um, for the industry. Um, we do not only um, supply these materials, but we also help our customers um, to design with plastics because it's very different from thermosets or um, glass as used today. Um, how to micromold uh, our materials. And we have um, global R&D capabilities with thermo optical labs where we support our customers molding lenses if needed, or we bring in molding uh, partners um, we have at hand, um, doing brief growth soldering, doing lifetime studies on uh, yeah. um, performance and um, all these um, kind of things. We also go one step um, further after the lens production, we look at um, how to place the lenses or the optical elements um, on the PCB, which adhesives uh, should be used and um, um, these kind of things. Um, so we are in contact already with uh, plenty of um, the attendees today or their customers. Um, we do want to get more engaged with others, obviously, to first of all learn what exactly is needed but second, we see uh, how our materials can bring value to the industry. And that's Fantastic. It. Now back to Peter O'Brien. Peter, mm -hmm. so we have here the semiconductor manufacturers saying that they, they do have technology based on semiconductor through the silicon bias and through glass fires. We had the, the company saying we are serving those semiconductor manufacturers with thermoplastic materials. Where does photonic integrated circuits here fit and what can we do together? Well, actually, one of, one of the things about working together is um, when I look at the different technologies, they all have, um, you know, merits and, and there's challenges. But actually, um, I don't know whether I'm answering the question exactly as you ask it, but actually something we're starting to see is around the system. 
So we look at the individual parts of the package and we say, okay, we got fiber, um, but we also have substrates. So for example, we've seen companies who can only afford for their application to work with PCB. So we say, oh, we must have a CTE matched, you know, a ceramic or something like that, but actually it's not viable in some cases. So they, they need to use a PCB. One of the problems there is that the PCB will warp. As a result, the pick warps. As a result, if you're aligning fibers, for example, or micro lenses, you're going to get misalignments. So we've seen in our own measurements with a PCB and um, flip chip pick, you're looking at over a five millimeter, which is common for a pick. You're looking at about three to five microns across that, that, that length of uh, facet. That means that the, the chip is going to misalign. So if you have micro optics, um, albeit they're, they're stable with reflow, et cetera, and the board that you're sitting on may actually cause a massive problem. And I think where this is really going is we need to develop much more integrated models. So the thermal model and the mechanical model, the optical model, and even the electrical model start to work together. So you get data out of your thermal mechanical model, it feeds it into ZMAX, for example. So um, another scenario we're seeing in cryogenic, and it's very extreme packaging, but for quantum. So the chip shrinks, you get CTEs, you get the substrates, all these things. This, that's an extreme example, but it's going the other temperature direction. So you need to start to develop more accurate models. So um, bringing the, the design, this kind of multi-physics is really, really important. Um, rather than just looking at the optics and saying that interface, you know, the PCB, the carrier may actually affect it as well. So this kind of multi kind of design is very, very important. And again, I, th I think it's something we should be kind of standardizing and starting getting the, the, uh, the software companies working with us much more closely. You said roadmap of, of ATNS. You saw what they want to be in one, two, and three years. In my mind, you play a very important role on that, Peter O'Brien. I already made the connection. I'm very excited about this. And now I would like all of us to go to... Canada to go to Bromont. Our next speaker is Alexander Jantapolsinski from IBM in Bromont. Thank you very much for joining this meeting. Tell us what you bring to the table and afterwards we have another fantastic Q&A. The floor is yours. Excellent. Do you hear me? Loud and clear. Excellent. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present uh, some of our offerings. So we are IBM. We are the largest North American base uh, OSAP. Oh, sorry, just one second. I have to Put back focus. Okay, excellent. So we are located in Canada, uh, in this northeast uh, corridor. We have 850,000 square feet of manufacturing facility. We do mostly advanced flip chip packaging and also silicon photonics. We can as assemble any wafer source. We're the master of complexity and advanced packaging. We also have outstanding characterization capabilities. We have a great FA lab, world class. We can help with design for manufacturing, design for test, and we can enable a better time to market. Uh, in our ecosystem, we have this main facility uh, where we produce the volume production, but we also have a dedicated development facility. So we have 860,000 square feet of this development facility where we have uh, copies of the uh, manufacturing line in this development facility, but we can play, we can introduce novel processes, novel materials without pertur perturbing the main production on the main, main plant. And this enables us to uh, develop those new processes, uh, for example, for photonic packaging. And once they're ready, ready, we can just transfer those to the main production. Uh, what is our offering? Of course, IBM, uh, Crown and Jewel, those big mainframe, those big uh, uh, technological programs uh, for IBM is one third of our, our business. Uh, two third of our business is about datacom, uh, satcom, telecom. Uh, you have here an example. Uh, we are in the, this uh, RF and 5G uh, sector. We do those uh, phaser antenna modules. Uh, we, we do Oh, sorry, I, I forgot to start my video. Um, uh, we do, do do those phase area, those data controllers, those uh, antenna. We do uh, provide uh, those big switches for those uh, uh, telecom, those high performance computers, uh, a co component for the data com, uh, infrastructure. And we see more and more though, about those system and package. When you have a lot of heterogeneous integration inside the same device, so we can see like a, a small PCB board when many functions are included, for example, RF and optical together in this system and package and we see more and more about uh, those traction in those uh, encryption card and RF over fibers, uh, for example. And of course, we do support custom design uh, for our, our customers. Next slide. So 
when we're thinking packaging, so the packaging is really about integration and you can have a, a disintegration of various function inside the same system package. So this is why the headers integration is very important. And here we have uh, uh, some pictograms of various uh, 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 aspect to consider in your packaging. And basically we have a department for all of these, for example, for simulation, for optical performance and, and mold copper design, for, for measure and test, uh, for electrical performance, thermal management. We are expert in the, those high power, high thermal envelope uh, MCM package. Uh, we can do substrate design. Uh, we do, of course, high reliability. We are specialized in those high grade uh, electronics and photonics, uh, chip package integration, cost and yield. We have this uh, amazing predictive manufacturing and, and modeling capacity uh, that rely on huge data sets. So we're really able to virtualize our, our qualification and, and, and be able to, to assess correctly uh, the, in the stress in the package and correctly understand what's happening. So the packaging is the cre critical for the success and we have to have this co-design packaging in mind when we try to have this pick chip with electrical chip, chip uh, interfacing at ASIC. And here you have a little example of a, a switch uh, example. Here we have some example of uh, products that we do assemble. So we, of course we do those uh, large uh, flip chip MCM where over 20,000 C4 electrical connection of this uh, die are made to the substrate. So this is an IBM server. We of course have those uh, multi-chip module or MCM or heterosynthetic carriers, so system and package where a very high complexity is made. Of course we do custom design. We also have this coreless uh, where you can remove the fin core and you have better electrical properties. And of course we do uh, all to uh, chip scale package 2.1, 2.3D, when you have those extremely high density laminate on the on, on the substrate. We have also those interposer, the 2.5 and 3D uh, interposer like, and also we have photonics. And today I will discuss about uh, a bit more about our photonics uh, offering. So our view about photonics is, is, is instead of having a, a custom design to rely on active alignment and, and, and with manual low volume and doing one or a few connections at a time, we believe, believe that uh, to lower the packaging costs is, is to increase the scalability and, and be able to reuse standard design, uh, use automation uh, that will, uh, will rely on self-alignment and perform multiple connections at a time. And this leverage the microelectronic packaging infrastructure know-how. And we had a few comments earlier, and of course, packaging and tests dominate the cost structure of integrated photonics when we compare it to microelectronics. And this is why this is very important to have a good packaging and tests in mind uh, to, uh, to tackle this cost structure. Here you have some of our photonic test vehicle. So of course, IBM is very uh, IP protective. So we don't show any of our customer design, but this is IBM uh, test vehicle that we use to demonstrate our, our packaging processes. And, uh, and as we had been mentioned, there's the PDK from the wafer and there's the ADK for the assembly design kit. So we have our assembly design kit. Uh, we share it under uh, CDA uh, with the, the various wafer fan. I will just present a few of the, the, the test vehicle here. So we have this high fiber quantum application. This was a 68 by 68 millimeter with 100 single mode fibers with nine uh, optical uh, uh, engines. Those optical engines were loopbacks. Uh, so mostly to, to validate that the downstream process doesn't, doesn't alleviate the, the optical uh, coupling here. Uh, we have also a polymer uh, technology. So this is uh, adaptive coupling, uh, basically. So we have uh, 25 micron optical port density uh, at the chip. So this is for those uh, that people that need uh, thousands of optical port on the same chip. So this is the extremely high density uh, of uh, uh, optical connection. We also have this integrated connector where our, uh, a standard uh, fiber array with the empty ferrule is secured to the lid. And we have this spring latching Mac mechanism that do the mating between the two empty ferrules uh, to, uh, to be able to package a, a big complex products, for example. And we also have our, our, our solder refillable fiber array. So basically, as you can see, this, this little transceiver engine with, with our fiber uh, array. So you have 12 uh, uh, single mold fiber here that are attached. And this is a uh, surface mount technology. It can be reflowed refillable. Uh, so this is the, and the, you can here see how our fiber are put inside the V groove with the mold coupler. And we have here a uh, uh, strain relief uh, of the of the ribbon uh, uh, that is secured to the to the lid here. So when we're thinking about thick packaging, so of course the best way is having a monolithic integration as shown in figure A and B, where all your function are inside the same peak. And this is very good, uh, especially if, if you can have your, all your, your, your functionality because you can remove all those ESD protection and have extremely good 
uh, uh, electrical uh, integration in, in this monolithic version. Uh, between A and B is basically if you have your chip overhang to give access to the optical region, or you have a hole or opening inside the substrate to give, to give access to this optical kitchen. But sometimes it's not possible to have uh, everything you pick. So you have your electrical die and your pick die that are made on separate node, and you have to do a, a integration and, and kind of MCM fashion. Uh, as you can see in C and D. In the C version, they're laid out on the MCM way. As in D, they're more in a face-to-face -face configuration where the pick was inserted inside a little cavity. And this is needed when the distance between the electrical die and the pick die need to be very, very small uh, in, in a face-to-face -face configuration. Uh, sometimes it's preferable to not have an uh, opening and just have an interposer that jack up the electrical die and having the same face-to-face -face configuration, but the, the pick is not inserted inside the, 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 the substrate cavity. Or you can have it uh, uh, organic interposer here that basically will uh, per permit to have some redistribution layer, still have a very good face-to-face -face, uh, configuration through the, 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 the interposer, but still you will be able to drive power when there's a huge uh, overlap area between the electrical and pick die. And the G and H research are 3D packaging. And all of those uh, packaging configuration are available at Roman. So I will start first with our uh, polymer uh, adiabatic coupling. So those are some optical results. This has been presented uh, in December uh, oh, sorry. So those are the news results had been uh, published in December at ECOC. So this is our new uh, uh, coupler uh, for the O-band that has been uh, put at IMF, so IMF in Singapore. So this is uh, the wafer fab where, where our polymer uh, pick are coming. And as you can see here, uh, they have the spectrum. So the O-band spectrum with the four uh, uh, CD, CWDM4 uh, uh, lambda, so the four uh, lambdas where you can encode information for the O-band. And as you can see, uh, we are all between 1 and 1.5 dB uh, for the full spectrum. And this is an essential loss per facet, but it includes everything. So the single mold fiber to the polymer coupling, uh, the poly so at this end, so this is a, a standard uh, empty ferrule. Okay, it's custom made for the polymer and it's made to a, a standard empty. So the fiber of the empty to the polymer coupling insertion loss is, is con considered. The polymer propagation loss because pro polymer has a bigger uh, propagation loss. And also the polymer to pick coupling. And everything is included in this insertion loss. So it's really from, from one end to the end. And this is amazing results. And this is by doing uh, uh, adiabatic coupling. So it's basically self-alignment pushing the, the ribbon inside some guiding structures and having the, the wave waveguide of the polymer aligned to the nanowire invert nanolinear inverted taper of the pick pick and here you have your or, or test vehicle when your the polymer is here highlighted and the in, in blue and the pick to power region is in red. We also have some repeatability so we did uh, 48 samples and here you have our, our, our repeatability measurements for the T and TM. So again, self-alignment, automatic process for the for the power polymer to pick interfaces and also the polymer to the ferrule. But we use active alignment at this phase to remove uh, the uh, MT to MT loss. It's, it's less than half a dB, but we want to remove this half dB to just have the pure, the pure uh, connection from the polymer to the pick. And as you can see, we have amazing uh, very good distribution. We are all between one and 1.5, or, or lowest measurement 1.8. So this is very, very good reason. And uh, we're using polymer, so this is a complete matter for CPI risk and can go to extremely dense uh, pitch. And it's uh, can be as uh, it's using a high throughput pick and place tool for assembly. Then I will show our, our V groove coupler that uh, Peter has uh, mentioned uh, previously. So basically, the main idea here is having a fiber array that can, you can place down inside some V groove structure. And at the end of the V groove structure, you have a mold coupler. Our mold coupler is a suspended membrane where metamaterial is is is, is patterned. And this metamaterial is mold converter is designed for for the engineering. Uh, mode engineering for max tolerances. Because if you look at all the tolerances for, for example, the V-groove width, the fiber diameter, the fiber core concentricity, and you put all those variation in this top uh, right image, you can see this uh, Monte Carlo distribution off. And you can see that at the end, your your core to the, to the mold coupler structure alignment will be within one micron uh, uh, when you consider all the self-alignment process. And we have designed our mold coupler to have this one micron acceptance uh, to be uh, uh, rely on self-alignment to, to correctly uh, couple the light in. 
As you can see, uh, we, there's two portions. So there's one for the structural adhesive that will be a mechanical and stable resistance. It's solder reflowable. So it will hold the fiber in place and keep them aligned. And it's extremely uh, chosen for manufacturing purpose. It's a, a quick UV tack, five seconds. And then the, the complete cure is done in the batch process tool without impacting the throughput of the high, high pick and place tool. And we have an optical adhesive that in for this, in the, where the mold copper is used. And this, this one is choose to, for the optical performance and to reduce also the, all the stress in the package. Here we have our, our coupling. So you can see we're sub DB coupling. We have point set DB for the TE, 1.4 for the TM. We have a little bit more uh, sensibility, but we coupled both position. And it's also a pick, uh, compatible with a pick and place tool as the fiber just fall down inside the array. Uh, it, it's reflowable. And one other thing that I had to mention, uh, we do have those array with pre clock PM fibers. So we can have PM fibers in the side of our array and basically make our PM fiber fall down the V groove and, and align them as the same way as a regular single mode fiber. So we can uh, extremely efficiently include our PM fibers uh, in our array for uh, packaging. And uh, here in the middle uh, uh, graph, you also have our uh, back reflection. As you can see, we're all. Uh, better than 31 dB, and this is very important, uh, especially when you have the, your lasers and uh, other uh, aspects. So you have here the, the reflection of all the features from info fiber and from the uh, mode coupler structures. And, and as you can see, where uh, a, a back reflection loss uh, is very, very good. Uh, of course, we do a flip chip photonic. So, so uh, a global photonic can put receiver pad, we can bump them. And, and here is our test vehicle for flip chip photonics. So this was a 200 micron pitch interconnect. Uh, you have a opening for the V groove area where the fiber fell. You can see here uh, without the protective cover, just to, to show how the V groove area. And here you have a repeatability. So this is our, our insertion loss, the total insertion loss. So it does include the empty loss of the connector uh, at the end of this uh, fiber array. And as you can see, our average is 1.6 dB. This was done with a, a self-alignment automated process uh, for over 168 samples. As you can see, we're all over 3 dB. Uh, this is very good. Uh, it was using a formic acid flip chip bonding uh, because you need a fluxless solution to require uh, in maintaining the, the facet cleanliness and, and, and groove uh, 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 cleanness uh, to have the fiber that will correctly sit, sit down inside the V groove. Uh, and this is, uh, we use a temporary adhesive attacking fluid basically to, to hold the pick while going through the furnace. And we do, do, do have a fornic acid furnace at our main plant. And we also have a, a smaller r and one in the development center. And as you can see, we have no voiding cracking with the intermetallic on the solder and, and this formic acid is available at Beaumont. Uh, here we have some uh, of our reliability data. So of course we are solder refillable. This was using uh, our, uh, how we call it, uh, high sensitivity hardware. So basically where any misalignment is, 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 uh, is, has a huge insertion loss uh, change. So we're not in the, in the, in the, in the, in the acceptance range, we're more in the high change range to be able to monitor any slight misalignment. And basically you can see that we have five uh, solder reflow and basically we're within the mating error. Uh, we also did some thermal cycling. So first we use the Telcor just standard, but we then move for, to JEDEC like uh, standard as the, or optical or photonic engine will be very close to a hot ASIC and we need to be able to withstand higher temperature. So we, we are redefining those, those specification as Telcor is maybe a little outdated and, and we need maybe to have more uh, co-packaging because we are the co-packaging expert of photonics and electronics and we need to have those higher grade uh, 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 electronics like grade for photonics. Uh, and then you have also our damp heat uh, demonstration for over 2000 hours. So, okay, so our expertise, we have those advanced nodes. We can do those uh, approval material sets. We can help for prototyping to, prototyping to high volume manufacturing. We are the leader in microelectronic and co-package photonics. We, we are the leader in complex MCM and a complex system and package. We can enable, enable a better time to market. Uh, you're, you're already uh, using the benefit of our existing model and design team. Uh, we can also do beyond ground rule. We can do a customization and characterization for, for your application. And, and basically our business model, we are a co-design partner. We, we have those building blocks uh, and, uh, that, that are in, within our ADK and, and, and they're, it's an integrated supply chain with a wafer farm. So all the ecosystem is provided and we can help you to design and everything will be manufacturable. Uh, so we put our packaging know-how at your service and we, we, we focus really on your application and performance. And thank you for your time. And if you have any question, please do, do not hesitate to contact me.
Yes, Alex, there are plenty of questions in the chat, but uh, well, we, we are really, really impressed eh, for your presentation. Thank you very much for this. Uh, I, I, well, we didn't meet in one year, but I, I see you have been busy. Um, then uh, let, let me start with uh, our epic question. Um, what we can do for you? What we can do? Uh, you are here in front of all the ecosystem, the photonic ecosystem. Uh, do you have any challenge um, or any unmet uh, need right now? Yeah, so so we are uh, OSAT. We have those building blocks. They were made for volume manufacturing. But what we see is there's a need for, for co-packaging standards. Uh, I have seen a lot of discussion about having those uh, pick samples uh, to ease. So this is something of high interest for us. Also, uh, we are a lot involved in this OIF initiative to define those uh, CPO uh, uh, standards and, and packaging uh, uh, in this, the, those, those ground rules to design uh, a pick package. And, and, and we, we try to contribute in, with, in a packaging perspective in this, that domain. So, yeah. Okay, so then let's go to our chat. Uh, well, thank you very much for the answer. Um, maybe we can start with Michael. Uh, Michael Levy, uh, you had a question or a comment uh, regarding the ADKs? Yeah, um, yeah, Peter talked about the ADKs and you mentioned it briefly in your talk. You have a lot of different um, packaging competencies in Bromont. It's really impressive. I mean, uh, the slides are great. Um, and so you could really sort of impact a lot of the packaging trends. But what do you and your team think about ADKs, um, just like the PDKs in foundries? I mean, do you see this as something that's going to be growing and important um, as we look towards, you know, co-packaging solutions and standardization? Absolutely, you're totally right. Uh, ADK are very essential, and currently our strategy is, is more what we have demonstrated, and also there's this concept of having a reliable, reliable process. So we're developing those packaging ground rules, and when you look at our ADK, it's it's awful because when you look at the space that fibers need on the V groove uh, on, the, on the chip, it's huge. It's huge, huge, huge. So you need to have those those bleed out clearance. You need to have those those features uh, to, to, to package the chips. And they're, they're, they're taking a lot of space. So, so this is very important. And we do have our, our, our ADK and we, we, we have this process and we have a, a, a reliability demonstration. We also have those extremely uh, aging de demonstration. We do have those uh, laser aging, as, as Peter has mentioned, all with adhesive, those, those uh, plasticity or creeping are very detrimental. So we had to, to validate that and say, we have proven that our fiber attached can, can withstand centuries of alignment. It's solder reflowable. There were a lot of work in having those uh, secret sauce and uh, material uh, uh, selection. And this was a huge effort uh, to, to have those. And, and they are now ready in the ADK. No, thank you. Thank you. Great answer. Okay, thank you very much. Now maybe we can go to Source Microoptics because Wilfred has a, has a question here. And Wilfred, maybe now is a good moment to explain a little bit what is a Source Microoptics doing? Uh, well, yes, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Anna. Well, I was more wondering about the, the thermal management. And, and so, uh, first of all, again, uh, great slides, uh, very impressive, especially the passive alignment. <laughs> I'm worried a little bit about this, but, but I'm, um, I'm more thinking about when you integrate the light sources, you have to do more thermal management. So I saw a lot of copper and copper cores in, your, in the devices that you showed. And, um, and I'm wondering how, you, how this is going to be in the future. Are you integrating uh, the light sources as well? Because I, the lasers directly and the photodiodes, or is it more all just passive uh, optical components? And uh, I don't know, you wanted me to show some slides, so should I do that now or should I do that? If now? you have one, yes, if you have one slide to explain a little bit the um, okay, then I do that technology quickly, that I, the SUS is doing. So uh, share this one slide. So yes, um, so we, we, are, we are making micro optics. So there was not much micro optics in the last slide. <laughs> in the last slides, nevertheless, um, PICS is still a large part of our business. We do a lot of PICS these days. Um, we, do, uh, um, we do a lot in uh, the standard lenses, the run of the mill, what we call protruding lenses for, for all types of collimation efforts. And we do a lot of recess lenses, especially for PIC applications where 
we recess the lens, you can assemble them easily with other components. And then of course we do all these lenses that are used in the already used directly assembled onto the pick. We're also looking at wafer level packaging these days, but the alignment accuracy that is required there is, 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 is very tricky to achieve, but nevertheless, there are projects where we look into this on wafer level. And um, we have also some special features here, like you see here on the, on the right side. So we have these integrated mirrors. So if you need a 90 degree turn uh, on the micro lens, so that means this is an integrated device and also these gold pads for, for um, also for achieving a, a, a reflow based process uh, pa easily packaged. And then last but not least, uh, we also can etch uh, this deep reactive iron etching through holes into the silicon micro lenses and for, for more or less self-aligned um, um, packaging with, with alignment pins. So all of this has been done. Um, many of these features are high volume, or most of these features are already done in volume. And um, I would see how, how IBM sees this, how, how we can help with these features in their packaging efforts. And, uh, and the other question I had, uh, like I said before, how are the light sources handled and, and the thermal management if you integrate the light sources on, on chip? Thank you. So I will try to answer my, my, my best. Um, for, for the laser source, uh, Currently, what is the best way to do is to have those external uh, laser in fibers. So you typically have PM fibers that include. We do have a, a program to have those uh, flip chip laser on, on the pick chip, uh, and we're working on that. But uh, uh, to, currently, for the solution for, for, for production is to have those uh, uh, laser in fibers uh, to include. Um, then about the, the, those micro optics, and, and, and we, pre we prefer to have uh, uh, not use any of micro optics and having those fiber to V groove and everything will be like encapsulated. And, and we prefer that because it's, it, you don't need any hermetic packaging. And also, if you have any uh, uh, optical facet that can, can be open, it can be contaminated, you can have condensation, it's, it will lead you to those hermetic or quadriceid hermetic packaging, which can be uh, uh, more costly. And then, of course, when you're thinking about high power laser injection, and, and when you see the power that are the people envisioning for, for laser in, uh, and, and you look at the, the, the specs of those power, uh, uh, contamination and surface cleanliness is very important. And, and, and so this is, yeah, so we have to, to keep that in mind. Did I answer correctly your questions? Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, well, I, what we see is, see our clients, they, they usually use, uh, or I, I see a trend that they, these are already integrated devices. So the, the laser is directly packaged, co-packaged with the, with, the, with the pick more or less. So, and um, uh, I know what, it's very interesting and very great what you showed, but, but I don't, is there like a parallel development in the market that some people go for more integration, others um, go more for fiber-based lasers or, um, or pigtailed lasers even, so I'm not sure what is then in the end the, 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 the better way to go. Yeah, the, the laser will always be the, the, the weakest link uh, because they're the active, they have this, the, 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 they will age badly compared to other devices. So this is why we prefer to have those external laser bank, uh, banks or external laser source in, into your pick. And then you can re replace those uh, laser as they, 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 they fade out. Uh, but of course, as we see more and more of, of pick packaging, eventually having those embedded laser inside the, the funding device will, will, will help a lot in, uh, for, for self-testing and, and a lot of features. So we see that in the roadmap uh, to have uh, embedded laser for, for pick uh, uh, packaging. Uh, uh, but currently, our, our solution for, for volume production is to have uh, laser in fibers. Alexander, question from YouTube, from the YouTube universe. This question is coming from, from Ficon Tech, the company who have been Epic providing the active alignment-based equipment for manufacturing of electronics. Josue Parra has a question about the optical adhesives. The adhesive for the fiber array unit to be grouped is very important to not exert the stress in the membrane of the peak. Around what CTE and shrink percentage values are appropriate? I know I it's a very disclose. technical question. Yeah. Tell us as much as you can because we really can help you here. Okay, so what I can disclose, uh, we did an extensive survey of all the material that exists within this universe and within this galaxy. So we test them all. And in fact, we even modify what was existing to, to meet our application. 
so I cannot disclose their properties because this is our secret sauce and we, there was a lot of effort in, in developing those, those materials. And of course, yes, you're totally right. The CTE and addition and, and humidity uh, impact and those refillable compatibility of our adhesive were very important in their, in their uh, analysis and their evaluation. I, I like when you ask a question and you don't get an answer, but you still make it feel that you said something here. You know what I'm gonna get from that from your answer? That we can really come to you individually and I will make some introductions here. Delo is watching because I think we have some room for cooperation. Back to Anna. Well, there are still one question. I think Peter, you have a question, right? Yeah, what well, Alexander's just answered it. And that membrane, it's really, really nice, but it looks very delicate. So with the CTA of the polymer under reflow, I've seen some papers you published, Alexander, um, where you get bending and things like that. But is, is, is it a real challenge? You, you basically had to make a custom epoxy. Would that be a fair point? Yes, we did. Uh, uh, we have a custom uh, material and it is very expensive material, but we use like so small quantity. So it's, it's, it doesn't have any price impact. Uh, but yes, there was a huge effort in developing those and finding yeah. those materials. OK, that's thank you. Thank you. OK, and then, well, thank you very much for this uh, for this talk, for the discussion on time. Uh, yes, it was super interesting. Let's move in the agenda. And it's my pleasure to introduce a uh, Carl from Frankhofer Chai. So, Carl, if you if you are ready, the floor is yours. Yeah. Anna, thank you very much for introducing me here. Uh, can okay. you see my slide now? Yes, very well. <clears throat> so I will uh, give a talk on polyamide flex for high-speed RF chip interconnect. So it's a completely different topic now. It's regarding the RF. And um, so I'm coming from Fraunhofer HHI, Heinrich Hertz Institute. It's located in Berlin. And it's part of the uh, Fraunhofer Europe, uh, uh, these 75 institutes, which are located in Germany. Um, the Fraunhofer Heinrich Hertz Institute has seven departments, so it's mainly divided into two parts. One is uh, video encoding, so vision imaging technologies, video communication, application, artificial intelligence. And then the communication part, wireless, fiber optical sensor system, photonic network and system, and photonic components. So I'm working in the photonic components group, and the photonic components group is doing detectors, lasers. We have a indium phosphide pig foundry. So we have a complete indium phosphide uh, fabrication line with epitaxy, with several epitaxies. We do polymer hybrids, polymer picks, terahertz sensing and uh, prototype packaging. And of course, we do also the Marzeno modulators, fast Marzeno modulators based on indium phosphide. This is the group where I'm working in. And uh, here is the motivation of this talk here. So the evolution of the optical transceivers, it always goes faster, low power and smaller size with these pluggables. And what Michael Levy already mentioned that uh, nowadays the electrical line rate goes uh, towards these uh, high uh, baud rates of 100 gigabaud and more. So what we see is really, uh, uh, if we target now baud rates larger than 90 gigabaud and we want to have low power, we need really to have this heterogeneous integration with a holistic design approach. And that means co-design of PIC, IC and the RF interface. So what we faced here in the past, so 2016, we saw our people, other people saw this, this border here regarding the power consumption of the devices which have been built. And uh, we started there also to do this co-design with our modulators, with our EMLs, together with uh, special designed CK driver ICs, um, really co-designed uh, impedance, impedance, use these impedances which are really bringing us to the low power consumption. And what you see here is that we could bring down the, the power, con power consumption tremendously towards this area here. So what we have to do now, and if we want to go to 90 gigabaud at low power, the requirements for the RF chip interconnects are really 
demanding then. So what we have to do is co-design. So as I already mentioned that, and the co-packaging of driver and IC, uh, driver IC and the pick, I think it's uh, uh, absolutely necessary. And this allows then the low power designs. For example, one can use also open collector designs. To do that, one has to match the required RF impedance. And when I speak about RF impedance, it's not only the standard impedance, it's really the impedance what the device needs to bring down the power consumption and to speed it up. For example, for the modulator, what we are doing, we have here the two times 25 ohm differential drive, and then the, 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 the driver IC has to be adapted to that. Um, one needs a good thermal and mechanical isolation. Think about if you have a pick on tech and you want to do an RF interconnect to a driver, which is passively cooled on the module. And uh, of course you have to do multi, multiple channels. So you have to do a race. So the polyimide RF flex line fulfills these requirements. So what we do here, this is a RF flex line. This is now a one millimeter CPW line here in the cross section. Um, the polyimide, it's, it's, it's more or less, it's a thin film technology for the, for the, for the gold layer. The device is about 25 micron thick. And what we achieve here, if you do such a measurement, is way beyond 110 gigahertz, what we can measure at the moment. So this is only 0.5 dB. So it's, it's uh, really very nice and impressive from the RF performance. And what we envisioned here, this is now, a, let's say, an older 3D design study. If you go for a flex, um, for, a, for, for such a poly I might flex, it's not only uh, capable for having now, um, uh, let's say, normal uh, in the integration from the driver to the pick, but you can have, for example, here, a, a two planes, two different planes for the optic here in blue and the electric in the first floor, for example, and just you combine it here with the RF flex lines, just to give an example of what is possible with such an arrangement. So what we do, we do this uh, customized design. We do it on a four inch wafer uh, fabrication. After fabrication, we release these devices. And here on the right hand side, you can see what we get there if you apply it then on a test device. So uh, left and right are uh, silicon ICs and, uh, or, or indium phosphide and uh, just as a connection test and still we are way beyond the measurement, uh, uh, measurable 110 gigahertz, uh, uh, 3 dB frequency here. So this RF flex line enables heterogeneous integration and of the best of breed pick and IC technologies. That means we can choose really the best technology here. The connecting of the RF flex line is done by gold stud bumps solar spheres, like you can see it here with our suck solders, for example, gold tin solders. So we did also gold pillars and used uh, anisotropic conductive film. And uh, this RF flex lines, as I already mentioned before, this envisions really also small size 3D RF assemblies. You can bend it really very sharp, very uh, narrow uh, bend ready of just 100 microns uh, and, and, and so without compromising here the RF performance. So for board rates more than 90 gigahertz, the poly I might flex is one of the best internet, uh, uh, one of the best RF interconnect technologies, uh, what I can think of at the moment. Yeah, thank you very much. That's what I wanted to tell you today. Thank you very much, Carl. Super interesting presentation. Tell us, well, you know the, what is the epic question. Tell us about what kind of uh, collaboration, so how our members could help you with these uh, developments that you just showed. Well, the main point is that, that we are doing, of course, a chip development, so big designs. So this is our main, main interest. And of course, this, this uh, flip chip technology, what we are also doing, because you, you need to do the flip chip technology now, um, for this integration steps. And we do that also in different projects like uh, Peter mentioned it before with Photonic Leap. So there a lot of people are working together with us already towards this high boat rate. But I think the high boat rate is really the most important there. The most important thing is really to 
think about the RF integration. And so RF integration from the driver side, from the pick side, and also from the from the from the integration, really, really the, the RF um, interconnect technologies. And what I saw is that that uh, for the modules, the flex is already let's say in the OIF uh, uh, for 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 com for for connecting the, the the RF from the module to the PCB. But what we need now is really to bring all these RF technologies also inside the package. And um, well, I think um, this is something we do it because I think, or we think that it's necessary and bring the performance what we need and the power reduction and uh, low power consumption. And so I think we welcome all people um, which are interested uh, to, to look into, have a look into this technology. I see comments here in the chat from Michael Levy and from John from Bay Photonics. Uh, do you want to comment maybe? Yeah, this, this is Michael. I, I really like the fact that uh, you're, you're emphasizing RF design. I mean, we're looking at you know, high-speed polymer modulators at 70 gigahertz and really the RF becomes really tricky and becomes a key factor in both the device design as well as what the package will look like. And you have to really design both together. So I totally agree, this is really important. And I think Peter said the same thing earlier. RF is, as we go forward in higher data rates, it's gonna become key in how you address the packaging issues, not only the device issues, but the packaging issues too. So yeah, I, I totally support that. Okay, John, do you want to come in as well? Yes, I would. I mean, we're already undertaking this on certain projects where you're having to model uh, I.O. from the PIC through the connectivity to the um, I.O. on the, the uh, package and also the um, surrounds around the chip, the driver and the package. So we're already undertaking programs that include that involving various different RF simulation tools. Okay, thank you. And we have a question from uh, Jerun, uh, from FIX. Uh, Jerun, do you want to make the question by yourself? Yes, I was really wondering, Carl, how do you see the assembly of these flex lines in a production line? So is it like a flip chip pick and place tool, but then I can imagine you can assemble one side, uh, but the other side might be at a different height. So how do you like recognize the different parts then and do the assembly process? Well, you're right. You you come to the tricky part at that point. I mean, what what uh, we uh, envision here is that you do let's say sub assemblies uh, in a flip chip technology, and then you use these sub assemblies and bring that into the device and mount it there, doing only this. Uh, so you can do flip chipping of the IC and the pick, and then you just turn that that device later on flip it again and, and connect it into your um, module, for example. So there are ways to do that and uh, to, to achieve that. Single devices might be a little bit more critical because these all this alignment stuff, uh, if, if you do it in the lab, this is what we do at the moment and there you can show the performance. But then of course, I mean, um, I, I would love to have, a, let's say, a, a, a flex line bonder which can yeah. which can handle that directly uh, from 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 a large uh, like uh, like with a bonder doing it with a flex line but at the moment this is not available so we maybe this is a new uh, research topic <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for your talk, Carl, and thank you very much for this discussion. And Jerun, uh, don't mute yourself because now it's my pleasure to introduce you. Yeah. So now let's talk about the large scale manufacturing. And yes, uh, Jerun, the room is the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. I hope I can still share some insights that haven't been told there earlier. So uh, as, as last speaker. Um, I think for the people that know that don't know FIX yet, uh, we are doing volume uh, production of tonic integrated assemblies from prototype up to like volume. So we focus on like die preparation, thermal packaging, polarization maintaining fibers, so all the stuff that is required to make a tonics module and to help up uh, with our customers. Um, we are also, and I think it's not really stressed out so far, 
we're not only doing packaging for like telecommunication kind of devices, but also for visible wavelength range uh, for uh, red, green and blue devices that are being used in the biomedical area, as well as mid infrared devices. So it's like completely different mode fields, different wavelengths, different power requirements. Um, so it's not only all about the exact same like cost and metrics as that are applicable for the data communications environment. Uh, we also recognize that a pig by itself is definitely not a product. Huh? You always need to interface with the fibers. And I think it was brought up earlier uh, by Carlos, like all well, fibers and polarization maintaining fibers are a costly part. And if you're looking to the scale up to high volume, they're not reduced a lot in terms of like the cost. So there's still quite some manual labor involved in doing this, uh, this fiber polishing and determination around it. We also do the interfacing with the electronics. So it means we need to have like high density electrical printed circuit boards that are really going and combining the photonics and the electronics on the same carrier, as well as the thermal stabilization. I mean, a tech is not like a critical part, but it's costing several euros apart uh, if you want to integrate it. So if you have designs that can live without it, it's taking out quite some of the uh, cost. And all to all, like if you're looking to silicon photonics and silicon photonics roadmaps, uh, people are claiming like 10 cents per square millimeter or even less than that. And if you're looking to that, packaging will always remain like 60 to 80% of that packaging cost. So I don't see that changing. And I think for us, it's really the question to from our customers, how can we create an acceptable cost roadmap from the, the first prototypes that they can get from a multi-project wafer up until the volume production where they're making like thousands or millions of devices on the same process. If you're looking to like the automation, so that's like a few slides that I have on that. So we work together with Fraunhofer and like Semtech to get like the fiber arrays to be built using an automated tool, recognizing the stress rods, rotating them and putting them in the, in the fiber V grooves so that we have like a step and repeat process. So we can build like a few channel fiber arrays, but also with like hundreds of channels next to each other. If you're looking to the uh, the, the, the fiber array. So we are now having like a variety of these fiber arrays already on stock. So people can just use it off the shelf and, and take it from there. And we also work together with like Team Photonics to make spot size converters that we can directly attach using our fiber to chip attachment methodology. So we're using the exact same uh, strategies to assemble spot size converters that people can use. Since like depending on the platform that you're using, for example, quite some indium phosphide uh, chips or silicon photonics chips don't have spot size converters on the chip. So you need to have an external mean to blow up the mode field uh, before you can couple it efficiently to a fiber. For the automation, we also work with uh, FICOMTEC, so they're also on board today. And we have a very nice machine that is like doing a temporary alignment of a fiber array, coupling in light to the silicon chip. Uh, so we have like a signal, and then on the right side here, we can get a gain element automatically attached to the silicon photonics chip. And uh, it means like this part is a temporary chip chip or a chiplet configuration. And it really allows us to make like a step and repeat process to scale up the automation and to take away the manual labor that is required to do the assembly of a complete device. So you can add complexity of different chip materials without adding a lot of cost to your complete system. Um, the same we're doing as well with uh, FineTech, but then for the flip chip application. So we have manual bonders. We're here unwrapping our automated bonder that came in last week to really scale up the uh, fine placement accuracy. So we do active alignment, passive alignment with automated tools around it. And of course, as Peter was stating earlier, design for assembly design guidelines, that's going to be the key for like the prototypes that people are adhering to it. And it's taking out the the cost of the engineering on the first prototypes. And that's what you want to save on. Later on, uh, customers can customize since like a biological uh, company that has a consumable uh, sensor is something different than a product that we are making and which needs to survive on a satellite for 15 years uh, when it's flying in orbit and it's not serviceable. So we also see that our customers are having like different requirements when it comes to packaging. But the design guidelines are helping at least to like start with the same background in the initial phase and uh, before you're splitting off your customized development work. 
And we also see if you're not adhering to design guidelines, if it's not working on paper, it's also creating a mess when we are trying to assemble it. And these simple kind of like uh, wire bonding schemes, even though in electronics, it's standard to have the contact pads only at the periphery. For the photonics, people are like trying to figure out how to get all the chip functionality onto this small uh, chip area that they're getting uh, dedicated to them. Uh, we're also therefore not stating that we have design rules, but we have design guidelines. So we're we're providing guidance. And if you want to like go away from it, feel free to do so, but that's really customization and that might not be automatable in the end. So if you're looking to cost drivers during the, the scale up, so what we're seeing in the beginning, it's really about the amount of customized engineering that is required. So we have characterization package standards that are really enabling the customers to get like fiber arrays on one or two sides of the chips, printed circuit boards on the other two sides of the chips, so you can do some testing. Um, if you're then looking to like commercialization and scale up, we're really seeing hematicity. Is it an, a requirement or is it not? Especially for indium phosphide with active materials, you have nice big platforms, uh, but there's no real data yet on how hematic should these parts be packaged. And I know people are working on silicon dioxide preservation layers, uh, but it's not being qualified yet. So people are still demanding a, a gold box kind of package. And we are still looking to like hundreds of euros uh, for such a gold box. And depending on like the size and the complexity, there might be quite some NRE uh, upfront investment uh, required as well to get these first prototypes done. Also, if you're looking to like uh, ceramic and organic interposers, the bandwidths, they are significant. Mike was stating already 70 gigahertz or even like 100 gigahertz. So we need to go to higher frequencies. But what we're also seeing is that the, the path and gap distances bet between the electronic connections, they need to uh, change. Since when we do the packaging, for example, of some processors, we have like thousands of connections that need to be made with a flip chip methodology. Uh, and we need to have interposing materials that are capable of fanning out all these signals from the photonics chips. If you're looking to fiber arrays, yes, we can assemble polarization maintaining fiber array, but still it's more expensive than using single mode fiber array. And it's also, it's the, the fiber cost itself, but also the assembly steps that we're doing to it. So it should be like a careful decision whether you can use one over the other. So for prototyping, people are using PM, that's not an issue, but it's really when you're scaling up, how do you deal with that? So far, I didn't hear anybody talking about isolators since what we are seeing is that isolators are really critical uh, in protecting the lasers and getting a stable light source. And you can get them on an individual channel and you can assemble them in the fiber array, uh, but still you want to have like an array style and not an individual channel style where the price is scaling per channel that you're adding. Spot size conversions, I briefly touched on that already, what we're doing with Team Photonics. So like you can get it on a chip, uh, and that would be the preferred choice, since then it's already monolithically integrated. But if it's not there, we need to have an additional component that is being assembled. Active integration, well, we're seeing, of course, uh, edge coupling as well as flip chip approaches coming from the top. Uh, we see different directions, also multi-core fibers in the research or even multi-core fibers on the edge with like uh, two rows on top of each other uh, with Fraunhofer HHI doing like two layers of polyboard uh, redirecting the signals. We don't know yet how to like increase the shoreline um, um, at, to the maximum extent and what is actually required. But we are seeing that from a photonics perspective, we're already getting in quite some requests uh, targeting like 64 to 128 channels. So it means that there's a real demand for these very high channel counts that are not yet being like widely adopted in the data communications field. And for us, in the end, it's all about the automatability of the process steps. And one of these examples is already the polishing. Um, from my background, I've been seeing uh, connector companies making millions of identical connectors all with manual labor. And they still found it very hard in terms of process stability, how to get a fully automated system around that. And I think that's going to determine the, uh, the real existence and the value add during the scale up. I think a nice example of this is like a, um, uh, a component from a bioelectrical uh, product that we have been assembling, where over here there has been like a Vixel and a photodiode array 
a flip chip on top of a silicon uh, nitride carrier. So the light is coupled in and out using a grating coupler. Uh, using the Vixel is making sure you have a low cost source, which is insensitive to back reflections when it comes to the, uh, the light source. And you don't need to do any kind of fiber attaches and keep everything polarization stable on the chip. So it's ticking quite a lot of these boxes uh, to really go for something which is low cost. And that makes sense for this application. Also, if you're looking to the customers, like we started by doing the integration on a small printed circuit board, where in the end, it's just on a lead frame with an overmolded compound, but like getting this overmolded compound and the lead frame there takes an investment of like half a million to a million before you have everything tooled. So you need to have like a roadmap from the prototypes, how to get to like a volume part and to do the de-risking in between. So if you're looking to the Eptic question, where can we help you and where can you help us? I think, well, where can you help us? It's really in all these nice orange boxes uh, where we can help uh, use your support. There's a lot of beautiful orange boxes here. It was Koning's Koning yes, last yeah. <laughs> Friday, so that's fantastic. Congratulations on what you are achieving. Jerun Daos Fix, this is one success story of Europe. I love, I love to have an OSAT. And especially I love what you say in the beginning. It is not only about data on telecom, we're working with the visible waveguides also, with the visible wavelengths uh, to, to address other markets such as medical. Uh, for me, one key question, and there's a lot of questions in the chat as well, but one quick question is, what set of what part of the package is application independent and which one is application dependent and how you how do you address this not to have to reinvent the wheel for every customer so what you're seeing is that like our ref packaging is pack, packaging or technology independent um, but you need to have trace lines which are matching very nice to get the right impedance at the right pitches so once we have like the right cross section of a trace line, we can use it and reuse it in different PCB configurations. But you can imagine that each time we need to lay out a PCB, it's costing like uh, several hours of time to lay out the printed circuit board. And you need to do a custom run at a PCB foundry. Um, and for prototypes, yeah, that, that's like the, the high barrier. So when you're in volume, that's all fine, but it's really for the prototyping. We have a few questions for you. The first one is coming from Ifotech. Gunther Volrath, what's on your mind? Gunther, you are muted and I have a Mac to celebrate such accomplishment. <laughs> but yes, you are still muted. So bottom left of the Zoom window. We really want to hear you. A meeting on packaging is not a meeting until we don't have Gunther oh, talking. Loud and clear. Okay, so what is your question? What I can tell you? What we are doing, <laughs> what I think about fiber assembly, or <laughs> what's the question? Yeah, your question you, you got you put in the in the chat about silicon micro packages. Uh, yeah, the second, uh, that, that's a question. Uh, you know, we, we started the company with doing these golden boxes, which was sold to Finiza approximately 20 years ago. And uh, since then, I, we have never ever built any golden boxes anymore. Um, so a um, lot of people are now using blob top encapsulation or they are using silicon micro packages. And uh, this was one of my questions. Is there still a market for gold boxes, uh, for example, not only because of costs, but also, also because of size? Uh, for example, we have a medical customer, they are doing implants and uh, for sure they will never implant a gold box under your skin. So they are using very small hermetic housings built in a MEMS fab, which I'm not allowed to mention. Uh, so what do you think about these, let's say, type of hermetic housings? I, I, I think that's a, a great question. So, and that's also the discussion we are having with our customers. Since it, the, the package that you're choosing needs to line up with all the process that you have. So for example, if you're looking to RGB combiners, also the the gallium arsenide and the gallium nitride needs to be nicely protected, but that can be done with a local means by a glob top or by like a local cap that you're soldering on top. So you don't need to have the whole module to be hermetic with hermetic vitros, but only very localized at the places where you have sensitive components. Uh, exactly. That's also, as you mentioned, red beam blue, uh, that's what we are doing for augmented reality uh, customers. So they are using a very small size ceramic uh, package. So, 
yeah, I, I, long story short, I, I think I think the industry is moving away from these these gold boxes, and they are looking for much cheaper and much smaller, let's say, sub packages or however you would call it. But uh, you only more localized hematicity, hematicity instead of having a golden box packaging the whole module. Uh, Gunther, as a as a customized equipment supplier like Ifotec is, could no, you also no, add? No, no. Okay, tell me, sorry, tell no. me what is Ifotec? No, we are, we are not we are not doing any uh, uh, you know we are not building the, these machines. So we are working together with the usual suspects. Some of them were already mentioned. So we are let's say we are modifying these machines. We are we just ship the machine. We are just now shipping a machine to, to Asia, which is capable of doing 3 million bonds uh, per year, very high precision, well micron, fully automated. Uh, but we are, not, we are not in the business of FICOTEC or FINTECH or Tegeba. So actually, these companies are supplying their machines uh, to us. I, I visited you in Würzburg and I saw, the, I saw the machines of some of your partners and how you customize them for different applications. So my question is uh, the same one I asked to Jerun. You are making application dependent automated solutions. Uh, what is in your opinion right now the part of the package that is application dependent for LIDAR or for medical and which one is the application independent? The one that we can continue repeating for all applications. To be honest, our customers, but if you're talking about standards, standardization, uh, I, I don't see any path towards standardization yet. Not for our customers. You know, it's not my, my opinion, but our customers, for example, if you're thinking about solid state LIDARs, uh, augmented reality, et cetera. So these, these customers, they are doing their own designs and they will, they will keep it as, as a secret. So they will never, at, at last, at least for the time being, they will not work together with other companies sharing their know-how. So for example, uh, you know, flip chipping in SOA or flip chipping, flip chipping in DFP laser, isolator, non-isolator, usually no lenses, uh, flip chipping them with an accuracy of 0.5 micron. And that's what we are working on with several customers right now. So it's really their proprietary design how the, the wafer and the pedestals and metallizations will look like. So we are helping these customers, you know, how in terms of assembly, the let's say metallization stack uh, should look like, but uh, they will really keep it as a secret. And so we, we have, you know, all these projects are covered by, by NDAs. Yeah. So maybe it's a little bit different from Datacom because Datacom is really high volume business, Facebook, et cetera, Amazon, they are driving standardization because they, they want to bring the cost down. You know, that's the bottom line. That's the only, the only mm -hmm. thing they are interested in is it's costs. Uh, on the other side, augmented reality, so let's say not so mature markets, people are trying to do their proprietary stuff and they will not care. It. That's what I'm seeing for my Customers. From my naive point of view, I think you, Gunther, you, Jerung, and Alexander from IBM Bromont, you are the only ones being able to enable, to define what kind of the package is application dependent, because as Gunther says, only you know, only you know. I'm not sure how you can use that because it's very highly NDA protected, right, Jerung? Yeah, definitely. But uh, what we are seeing is since also, with, like uh, Gunther was just stating, with LiDAR, uh, we are working as well, of course, a lot with uh, with LiDAR companies and everybody is secretive about what you have on the chip. But things like alignment loops that you have on the chip itself allow us to make sure that we can do the packaging of the chip in an automated way and reading out the losses without knowing what's actually on the chip. So that's some, some way already to get like a highly protective uh, uh, secret area on the chip, while well, we only need to focus on the assembly task and we can build with FICOMTEC an automated machine that is capable of scaling up such process step. Uh, Michael, so, let so me, what the call me, call me, they are using. Sorry, sorry. Gunther, go ahead. Uh, yeah, yes, for sure. I think that's a standard more or less. So nobody is using this type of alignment. People have, they have their, their photo diets directly integrated on the chip or they have an, uh, an optical loop. Uh, that, that's pretty much, yeah, standard, I think. Uh, I think the main difference here is maybe comparing FIX with IPOTEC. I think FIX is very much focused on how to bring light into and out of the chip. So they are more on the 
let's say fiber assembly side, we are more on the on the die placement side. So fiber assemblies, we are only doing small scale, I don't know, 100 samples, 500 samples per year. Uh, we are more focused on how to flip trip SOAs directly in between waveguides on a wafer level, for example, six, eight, right now, 12 inch level. So very high volume, very full automated uh, processes. So I, I cannot comment as much on the uh, on the fiber uh, attach. I think here he's, he's much more experienced in how to do these type of assemblies. <laughs> Michael Levy, call me naive here, but when I see this discussion between Jerun Daos, Kunther, I do believe that there is a need to align all this industry and have an assembly design kit. But they are telling that their customers will not uh, like that kind of guidebook. Uh, you have been working on this with the roadmaps. How do you think we can address this chicken and egg question? It's a great chicken and egg, and it's not an easy issue to resolve. And you know, frankly, the photonics business, whether it's devices or packaging or even system design has been pretty custom and, and really fights standardization all the way. And so, yeah, what, what has been said today is true. Uh, standardization ADKs are gonna be difficult because everybody has their proprietary solution. But within that, there are some common themes that need to be addressed whether it's you know, things that uh, are front and center from our standpoint is low cost hermeticity. I mean, traditionally hermeticity was in gold boxes, right? So mm -hmm. but can you get hermeticity in a low cost scenario using you know, semiconductors, dielectric materials so that you know, the devices can, can withstand all sorts of situations? I think these types of things are gonna come to the front and I think we will see some ADK movement, just like Peter indicated earlier. But I also have to accept, you know, when you start looking at AR, VR, automotive, LIDAR, some of these medical applications, folks really want to protect their proprietary packaging. But I think within that, we're going to get, get some common themes, you know, level one, level zero in packaging. Um, speak, if you like. And some of those techniques, whether it's fiber alignment or flip chip bumping, are going to be common and we can actually do think about um, ADKs. And I think they will be more popular as we move forward. But it's going to be a fight. There's no question about it. No, I, I, and I love watching those. The final question of the meeting, the final question of the meeting goes to Francois Menard from Hyponics, a company developing silicon nitrate and MEMS together. Francois, what's on your mind? Well, the question was to Jaron because he was bold enough to speak of isolators, which is uh, uh, the, the great untold story about integrated optics uh, and, and, and the need to uh, collimate light and free space in order to get through an optical isolator. Um, uh, and uh, I was curious to see uh, how you saw this uh, uh, taking place in, 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 in an airy type form or at least uh, you you touched on it very quickly. So I was kind of curious to see what's your position on optical isolators. So at this point in time, we are just like a consumer of optical isolators as well as micro optical isolators, but these are just like single channel devices. Uh, we're now investigating whether we should be making like our own isolator, similarly as we're doing with the fiber arrays, that is really as a building block that everybody can just use it taking like a, a fiber attached already to an isolator and then you can connect it directly to a pick or we can connect it for you. I, I do believe that that's one of the huge and many needs right now to standardize the isolator, especially for the amazing work that you're doing fix on the hybrid laser assembly. That's a topic for another discussion because today was truly fantastic. First, with all the discussions I put together this slide, for me, there are four demands here. And one, we really had to have an assembly design kit for the OSATs to be able to offer the technology all in line. And I agree with Gunther, it's gonna be a hard task, but we love those. The second demand is on the RF connectors. We've seen the modulators are getting faster and faster. Like when Logic already, already has 70 gigahertz plus modulators, we need to have novel RF connectivity for that. The third, the third one is 
test before invest packaging for many different applications that we are targeting. Indeed, we are talking about 3D sensing, we are talking about medical devices. All these new end users need to find a way of test before invest and a standard package application dependent is a huge and met need. And the fourth one, micro optics are, are coming here to reduce cost effectivity for the fiber array assembly. I do believe this is a huge market for all of us. It's been two hours actually, two hours and 13 minutes. So let me apologize for those 13 minutes. I think it's been a really great meeting. What I want from you now is to make sure that you connect with each other. There has been here a lot of discussion, a lot of things can be shared, a lot of things cannot be shared, but everybody here is looking for partners, potential partners. So please make sure that you get introduced to any of the participants you think you can explore some business with. Today was the third meeting of the Series 4. I would like to remind you that at the beginning of June, we have a Vixel packaging meeting, and that's always the gold star of our meeting. So please make sure for those of you active in packaging Vixels that you register as soon as possible, and you tell Anna you want to give a presentation because I think she's going to have a headache selecting the speakers for that. Until the next time, my name is Jose. I'm really happy for all this meetings and on behalf of Epic, take care. No, first of all, wash your hands, wear a mask and get vaccinated as soon as possible because I can't wait to start traveling again. <laughs> See you soon. Bye bye.